Hey everybody, this is Scott McLeod with another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I have with me today, Kelly Williams. She is the, oh, I already forgot it, learner experience <laughs> architect and lead teacher yes. uh, um, for the Futures Lab in the Poudre School District in Fort Collins, Colorado. Scott Elias is the director of career, innovation, career and innovation for the district. I'm delighted to have them both with us today. Uh, Kelly and Scott, we're going to have to start by explaining what Futures Lab is and how it works. Sure. So Futures Lab is a, a new project in the district. It's a district program. And as a district program, it is open to any student at the secondary level. Uh, and as a program, not a school, we don't graduate students. We don't teach all subject areas. Uh, we teach some pretty specialized elective opportunities for students from any high school. So students will remain students at their home campus and then they come to us uh, for some classes that all carry high school credit uh, but many of our classes carry concurrent enrollment credit and they're leading to some sort of certification so specialized elective opportunities that are available to any student at any of our high schools and what are some of those electives how many students do you have so this year was what we called our pre-launch year. Uh, I was able to hire a real small team of which Kelly was one of the two lead teachers that we were able to bring on board. And we started pretty small. We started with three classes. We have a mobile app development class where we were teaching kids to code in Swift to develop apps for their iPhones and iPads. Uh, we had a uh, drone class, which uh, moved students toward their FAA 107 license. And then the class that Kelly taught was the business incubator class where students could come with a idea for a business uh, or no idea at all about a business and really just play with the idea of if I could start a business, what might that look like and what do young entrepreneurs need to know? So we uh, started the year with about 30 kids. And as word of mouth spread, we about doubled that and had to actually start a second section of our coding class in January. So we ended the year with about 60 kids. And looking into next year, we're adding some pathways, we're adding some teachers, uh, and we expect to be right around 250 students next year. That's fantastic. And doesn't surprise me one bit, because we know that when we give kids rich, robust learning experiences where they can drive a lot of their own learning, right, like they flock to it in droves. Mm -hmm. once, once they kind of see how it might operate. So that's awesome. Okay, so you got this awesome uh, learning space and, and this program where kids have a lot of agency over their own learning. They're doing, they're working on interesting projects and problems and real world challenges. Um, they are doing a lot of deep thinking and problem solving, right? And so on. They're connecting with the outside world around them. And then we hit remote. Right. So what does that look like for you all over the last couple months? Yeah, I'll let Kelly answer most of that. I'll, I'll say a unique challenge that Kelly and Alice and our other teachers had was that since we do share kids with all of the other high schools, we had to not only adapt, but we had to also adapt to what all of the other schools were adapting to as well. Um, so I'll let Kelly talk a little bit about what that looked like for, for her kids and for Alice's kids. Yeah, and in thinking about how to adapt with, um, you know, some of my students had seven different courses and seven different platforms and seven different ways to track what they were supposed to be doing in class. Um, I just kind of led with that learner-centered um, design. So I asked them, what could and should this look like? And so we co-created what our remote learning was going to look like. Um, and I even just asked them, like, how do you want to be communicated with? Um, so some of them were like, call me on my phone. Some of them were, let's do a Zoom or a Google Meet. Um, and so I just let them kind of drive a lot of that. Um, and so as we shifted, it was interesting to me, they all wanted a weekly face-to-face -face meeting. So we had that standing on a Wednesday. Um, and then Fridays, they wanted one-on-one -on -one check ins with each of them. And so we had standing meetings um, with five questions to reflect on the week. And um, I offered a lot of choice within, um, especially our one-on-one -on -one chats. So a lot of them either, I said, you could talk about content for class or you could talk about anything that's on your mind. And so some of them um, didn't talk anything about business incubator and they were just talking about their relationships with their friends and how those have shifted. And um, so we, 
we approached it with that, like, what do you need? How can I help? How can I support? Um, and it, it all incorporated that entrepreneurial spirit. So in times like this, we have to shift and pivot. And so we've been talking about that all year. So this was like a real world application of that, um, that experience. And how might we look at this with a different lens and see opportunities um, and also respect people that are struggling right now. Um, and so I kind of led our whole shift with that mindset of letting the learners drive it and co-creating it with them. I love how your existing mindsets and belief systems sort of drove the response, right? And, and drove the flexibility um, around, you know, adapting to your students. You're also a small program. I wonder if what you do sorry, what you did um, is scalable to a larger context. Any thoughts on that? You know, what about the, you know, large traditional high school of 1,500 to 3,000 students? Could they employ the same kind of approaches that you all did? Yeah, I think, um, you know, my students were engaged in real authentic work that they cared about. And so if kids are passionate about something, I think that's going to drive the learning versus me saying you need to go through these six different tasks by this date. Um, and so letting the kids, I, I was like, okay, so um, what were some celebrations from this week? What were some obstacles? What do you want to do next week? And so they led with their agendas. Um, it took a lot of work on my part to, to engage in those conversations. And if your class was a larger class size, that would be a lot to handle. But I think that there are ways to support kids and let them drive that, that, um, that will help them and also alleviate the work on the part of the teacher beyond just connecting with a kid. So do you think this kind of open-ended, student-driven, deeper learning is easier to implement remotely than a more traditional model or harder? I'm biased. <laughs> I will always lean towards um, the learner-centered, um, project-based. That's just um, in my core because I've, as a teacher, I worked in traditional setting and then I also worked in project-based settings. Um, and the learner-centered, I just, I think it trumps it every time with um, student motivation, engagement, passion. Um, they were seeking out mentorship from me and then asking me for connections with other people. Um, so I think that that's going to be surpass any other thing. Yeah. Well, Kelly, that's kind of what I was thinking too. You know, um, I, I kind of lean those directions as well as Scott knows. Um, you know, this idea that if you're just shoving content at kids that they don't care about, right? Mm -hmm. Like engagement motivation is really hard from a uh, distance because there's nothing else surrounding that work that's compelling to kids, right? Like if you're in a traditional high school, you might show up anyway, even though the learning work is boring, you think, because mm -hmm. your friends are there, you got extracurriculars or sports or whatever, right? So, but now all of that has been taken away and all you have is the low level learning. And we're hearing from a number of families and kids that that is just not enough, right? But under your modality, right, where kids are, like you said, it's very learner-centered, it's project-based and problem-based, it feels like, you know, they, they own that in a much different way and can keep that rolling along no matter where they are. Yeah, uh, and, and it's just, it's, it's motivating for them. Um, you know, we had a small class and everyone was working on different things and, um, we we came together and in, in those class meetings and they were able to give each other feedback and they they wanted that so the our wednesday meetings were optional if you can make it come and most of the part they came um we even had some mentors from our local university from csu join us um and so they were there every week too um because they wanted to be a part of the work um and so i think when you offer students an opportunity to run with something that they're passionate about and that they care about, then the learning doesn't end when your classroom ends or when the school day ends, it's gonna prolong. And I've had, like, I got a text from a student today saying, I asked him, what's next for you? I saw your, 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 the video you produced for your project, what's next? And he listed this, this laundry list of things he's up to next. 
So um, it's inspiring to me as an educator. This is this is what's energizing. So the students are energizing me, and all I've done is given them a platform and let them go. That's awesome. Yeah. Scott, from a leadership perspective, what are some decisions you all made as a team that seem to work well, particularly during transition time? Yeah, I, I think the the decision to just kind of um, it's hard to say how we would have done it any other way that our decision was really like we had to let it be guided by the kids because the kids were being guided by their school and, and just mm -hmm. the culture in the district that we're in. It's very site based, very site directed. So there were very few directives from the top about how any particular school had to do remote learning. So we were kind of in this holding pattern as we always are uh, waiting for the big schools to kind of decide what they're going to do. Um, but, but the, you know, what Kelly said is, is exactly right. We have, we have kids that we have been working with from last August who made a choice to be a part of this program. Um, they are not all, they're all great kids, but they are not who you would walk down the hall and look at and say, well, there's a seven AP class kid over there. And um, these are not your all valedictorian kids that we have. And um, this has been my experience working with these teachers in this group of kids all year is we can have a day where snow is coming down and we're all slipping and sliding to get to work. And I'm like, there's no kid going to show up and we have perfect attendance. Mm -hmm. So when kids are bought into the learning and they are connected, um, coronavirus is just another obstacle and they're not going to let that obstacle get in the way of the work because when they come to us, we've, we've been very intentional about establishing a mindset that, they're, they're coming to work and they're making a choice to be a part of it. Um, so how does that scale at a traditional school? Definitely a challenge, um, but, I don't, but I don't think it's an insurmountable challenge, but if you can't wait for coronavirus and then start to instill the passion in, in the learners, if it's not there when coronavirus hit, you can't have them all be remote and then expect you're gonna flip a switch and have them all now all of a sudden be self-directed. And so as a parent, I've seen each of my kids has six or seven teachers, 13 or 14 different approaches. Some of them have been very good and some of them haven't. And, and the one that's watched this video on Monday and I'll see you next Monday, my kids are unplugged. Whereas the kids in Kelly's class and in our mobile apps class, you know, you, there's no stopping them at 3 a.m. Like our teachers have to turn their cell phones uh, off because yep. they're getting WhatsApp at three o'clock in the morning with here's my <laughs> business idea or can you look at my code? Right. So I it, it just, it was an easier transition for us because our kids have brought that mindset from the beginning mm -hmm. um, because that's something we've actively worked to cultivate in them. Right, absolutely. And, you know, Scott, I know you're familiar with Iowa Big in Iowa. Um, and, you know, what I was struck by when talking and working with them and their students is that um, they're a program like yours. They're a partial day program, right? Um, and the kids, you know, the students are more willing to put up with some of the traditional stuff when they also have an outlet over here, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what you're articulating is that from a scalability standpoint, it feels to me that whether remote or face-to-face, -face, kids need some of this kind of, you know, learner-driven, project-based work. And if you can get them, you know, it doesn't have to be all day, but if you can get at least some of that, then they're more willing to put in some time over here as well, right? So doesn't have to be all or nothing, I think is what, what I'm trying to say here. So we're kind of nearing the end of our time. Uh, as you all look forward into the summer and next fall, uh, what are you thinking about? Anything else you want to share? What's on your mind? Uh, I think from my perspective, looking at the challenge of growing to meet the needs of a larger group of kids, and, and one of the things that we've worked on at, at on our leadership team is how do we, if we're in a position where we don't have kids at all face-to-face -face or limited face-to-face, -face, how, how might we continue to maintain the culture we've already established? So that, that relationship building piece that we did at the beginning and the establishing of kind of our norms and values, um, you know, when you walk through these doors, it's different than the school you left, which is great campus not you know they you serve 2,000 kids differently than you serve 200 kids um, how do we do that and how do we norm that and I think we can do it uh, we're just gonna have to be even more intentional about doing it in in whatever the fall environment looks like what about you Kelly what do you think yeah um, one thing that I think is gonna be a challenge is we're hoping 
that Futures Lab breaks down those barriers between pathways and school classes so that it's not like you go to this class and then you leave, but you're intermixing and you're mingling and you're seeing the relationships between a coding class and a business class. And so how do we create that community um, potentially when we might be remote from the beginning? So I think that's a that's a foreseeable challenge for us that we need to innovate and iterate on um, as we prepare for fall. Awesome. You two are awesome. Futures Lab is awesome. Thank you for your time today. Much appreciated and uh, hope you all have a restful summer. Thank you, Scott.